on the yacht. Mystery. We proudly present Hollywood. <laughs> Theater brings you Ronald Coleman and Heather Angel in A Tale of Two Cities. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Healy. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In Paris just a few months ago, I passed daily through the Place de la Concorde where, during the French Revolution, stood a symbol of the violence of that bitter period, the guillotine. Everywhere were Americans, experiencing, like myself, that lingering sense of great events long past, but not forgotten. Something Charles Dickens must have felt on his first visit to Paris 100 years ago. We present the immortal story it inspired, A Tale of Two Cities. Starring one of the screen's outstanding actors, Ronald Coleman, in one of literature's most moving and dramatic roles. A role, by the way, that he created on the screen. And with him, we present the talented and lovely Heather Angel. It's time for our curtain, and the first act of A Tale of Two Cities. Starring Ronald Coleman as Sidney Carson, with Heather Angel as Lucy Manette, and Janet Scott as Madame Lafarge. <laughs> Paris, 1793. The French Revolution is over. The cause is won. But the bloodshed has only started. The reign of terror sweeps through the land in all its fury. And each day, Madame la Guillotine is fed her share of human life. The dripping blade rises and falls. And the crowd counts in monotonous rhythm as each noble head rolls to the ground. The knife rises again and sweeps downward. Twenty-two lives in a single day, and more to come, and more and more, until nightfall draws a curtain on the sea. Behind the bleak walls of La Force prison, the doomed of the following day await their fate. In a bare dungeon cell, a single lantern throws a ghostly glow on their faces. With a rattle of chains, the great iron door is thrown open. Everyone rise. Rise, aristocrats. In the name of the people of France, the tribunal hereby declares that you shall be put to death by the guillotine on the morning of February 2nd, 1793. Citizen Taylor, which one of these is Charles Debremont? Everyone, step forward. Everyone, Charles Debremont, call Charles Johnny. Which one of you is he? I am Everyone. Step forward. Charles Debremont, known as Charles Johnny. In view of the excitement occasioned by your trial, it was felt that some small favor would be in order. We've decided, therefore, that you shall live long enough to witness the execution of your friends here. Fifty-one heads will fall tomorrow. Yours will be the fifty-second. It is in every month. Yes? I didn't know you were here with us. It's so dark. I know. Well, what is it you want, please? Don't you know me? I'm Lizette, the seamstress. We were brought to La Force together. Oh, yes, of course I... I, I forget for the moment of what you were accused. They accused me of plotting. But I'm innocent. How could I plot against the Republic? I love you. I know what. Don't cry, child. It's too late for tears. I try to be brave. But soon the morning will come. It's growing light even now. You have an hour yet. Perhaps more. Ask God for courage. Look, the sun is rising. I'm afraid. Yes, I'm glad. At least we can see again. We can... What is it? You are not a Vermont. You are not Charles of Vermont. What? Why are you Charles of Vermont? His eyes were blue. Yours are brown. His hair was white. And you're... Who 
for you. Like you, I, I'm nobody. But you are going to die, it was him. Why, monsieur? Oh, I could never make you understand. But I could set you free. One word no. for me. You can't do that. You must not blame me. Tell me about yourself. How can I? It would help so if you talk to me. Perhaps it would help you too, monsieur. There's so much to tell. It all began long ago. When? Twenty-five years ago. 1768. Have you... Have you ever been in England? No, never. Well, there's a long hill on the Dover Road that sweeps down to the sea. It's a pleasant road on a summer day with the sun shining. But the devil's own highway at night in the winter rain. On just that sort of night in 1768... A coach topped the rise of the hill. The mail, bound east for Dover. Yes, get up, get up, get up. Top of the hill, Tom. Better rest for a moment. Oh, oh. Uh, we'll be lucky if we make the boat for Calais by this. Hear that? What do you say? I say a horse with a canter coming up the hill after us. I say a horse with a gallop. Oh, there. Stand her up higher. Royal, what do you want? Is that the Dover Mail? I want a passenger. What passenger? It's a Jarvis Lorry. Hey, where you are. Is there a gentleman named of Jarvis Lorry in the coach? I'm Lorry. Who wants me? It's me, Mr. Lorry. Jerry. I know this messenger guard. There's nothing wrong. I hope there ain't. Hello, you. Come on to the foot pace. Well, Jerry, what is it? A dispatch, sir. Sent out to you from London. Be quick about reading it, sir. I don't like this. It's not very long, you see. Wait at Dover for Mademoiselle. Very good. Jerry. Yes, Mr. Lorry. Ride back to London as fast as you can. Tell them my answer was recalled to life. Recalled to life. That was Mr. Lorry's business that night. To recall to life a man who had been buried alive for 18 years a prisoner of the French nobility. But the man had escaped and was now hidden by friends in the village of Saint Antoine. To that village went Mr. Larry, to the wine shop of a certain Madame Defarge. You are Madame Defarge? I am. My name is Jarvis Lorry. I've just arrived from London. This young lady with me is Miss Lucy Manette. Good morning, mademoiselle. Please tell me, is my father here? Is he safe? Your father? There is no one here, mademoiselle. <laughs> Mr. Lorry was uh, told that... One moment, my child. Madame Defarge, perhaps I should have presented my credentials sooner. Recall to life. There is a man here. A man old beyond his years. A lender of shoes. Will you come this way? My husband and I have kept him locked in a room upstairs. Did you say locked? Yes. Of his own desire? Of his own necessity. He has lived too long alone. He would be afraid that his door was left unlatched. Mr. Lorry, I'm frightened. Hush, my dear. Father. Good day, Dr. Manette. You are hard at work. Yes, I am working. You have a visitor, Doctor. Show him the shoe you are making. Now, tell Monsieur the maker's name. You are my man? Yes. One hundred and five North Tower. That is all. One hundred and five North Tower. You see, Monsieur, he remembers nothing. <laughs> Dr. Manette, do you remember nothing of me? Look at me. Is there no old banker, no old business rising in your mind? Think of England. A man who is your friend, Jarvis Lorry. It is no use. This is what they have done to him. Lucy, come here, my child. Now speak. Call him. Yes. Speak to him as you did long ago. Father. Oh, Father. Who is this? Do you remember, Dr. Manet? I remember a little girl with long golden hair. Ages and ages ago. What was her name? Her name? She laid her head upon my shoulder when you came to me that night. Don't let them take you, Father. Hush, my child. 
My baby. No sleep. No sleep. They crossed the channel that night to a safe refuge in England. There, for five years, the good doctor rested until at last his memory returned and he was well again. But now, in the English court, the trial was in progress. The trial of a certain Charles Darnay, accused of plotting treason against His Majesty's government. Dr. Manette, called as a witness, sat with his daughter near the judge's bench. The court was hot, humid. Only one man seemed quite at ease, the assistant counsel for the prisoner. His court wig dipped in a slovenly fashion over one eye, his court gown stained with wine. His name, <laughs> if anyone was interested, was Sidney Carton. Cart, we must act quickly. With the evidence they presented, Darnley will hang by morning. Carton, you hear me. Yeah, I hear you, Mr. Stryver. Well, what shall I do? Uh, if I were you, I'd sit down. Darnley is my client. I'm trying to protect him. I pay you well for your assistance, and I expect to have it. You will have it, Stryver, when the time comes. Well, I see you've already had your bottle today. <laughs> I do, I believe. Drunk. <laughs> Always drunk. Carton, <laughs> listen to me. At the present time, I'm more interested in Dr. Manette. Dr. Manette to the stand. You are Dr. Manette. I am. Dr. Manette, the prisoner Charles Darnay has been accused of carrying secret messages from Louis of France to spies here in England. Look upon the prisoner. Have you ever seen him before? I don't know. Really? Is it not true, Dr. Manette, that the prisoner was a fellow passenger with you five years ago on a boat from Calais to Dover? I cannot say. When I came from France that night, I'd been newly released from a long imprisonment. I have little remembrance of the occasion. My mind was blank for some time. I see. Your daughter made the trip with you, did she not? Yes. That will be all. Are there any questions from the defense? Any questions, Carlton? No, no questions. No questions, Your Worship. Miss Lucy Manette to the stand. Now, Miss Manette, look upon the prisoner, please. Have you ever seen him before? Yes. Where? On board the packet boat you mentioned. You spoke to him? You were friendly with him? Yes. Good. And now tell me, did he come aboard alone? No. When the gentleman came aboard... You mean the prisoner? Yes. Then free the prisoner. When the prisoner came on board, there were two gentlemen with him. But these two did not make the crossing. No. Now tell me, did you see them give certain papers to the prisoner that night? No. You're sure of that? I... I don't know. It was dark. Then they might have given him certain papers. Yes, Is that right? That will be all, Miss oh, Manette. Please, I know that you will be all, please. Are there any questions from the defense? Will Carton? No. Carton, you're mad. No questions. No questions, Your Worship. Your Worship, the prosecution would like to recall its chief witness, the prisoner's accuser, Mr. John Barsen. Ah, now, now, Shriver, we might have some questions. Mr. John Barsen? Right here, sir. Mr. Barsen, look upon the prisoner. Do you recognize him? I do, sir. He's a spy against his Majesty's government. That's what he is. I was on that mail packet myself that night, and I saw the kind of papers that passed into the hands of the prisoner. They were lists of our troops. Thank you, Mr. Barsa. And no more questions. The counsel for the defense. Well, Carton, ask you these questions I've written down here. Uh, uh, Mr. Barsa, how do you know the papers you saw were lists of British soldiers? I saw them. Ah, you saw them. Then you took them out of the pockets of the prisoner, Charles Darnay. Yes, sir. And uh, no, sir. They fell out, they did. Oh, then you didn't take them. You're not a spy yourself. A man who makes his living by making accusations, just or otherwise, against his fellow countrymen. That's a lie, a downright insinuating lie. Uh, uh, one moment. Will Carton? Uh, Stryver, you've no imagination. Uh, Mr. Barthard, where do you get money to live on? My property. Your property? Where is it? I, uh, I don't exactly remember. <laughs> Perhaps you can remember how you got that property. I inherited it. From whom? From relatives. Uh, distant relatives. Ah. How many times have you been in prison, Mr. Barsad? Six times, isn't it? What's that got to do with it? They have been kicked. The cheating advice? Uh, well, and now... Mr. Barsad, 
You are positive it was the prisoner you saw that night with those lips? I am. It couldn't possibly have been someone else. No, it couldn't. Uh, uh, Mr. Donne, uh, will you please face this witness? Careful. Well? Now, Mr. Barsad, look at me. At me, the assistant counsel for the defense. You notice the resemblance between us? <laughs> ah. We're very much alike, are we not? Well, uh, now that you, uh... <laughs> I mean, Finnick, you are. As a matter of fact, it could have been me who saw with those supposed lists that night. Couldn't it, Mr. Barsad? Well, uh, now... Couldn't I... it, Mr. Barsad? All right. Yes. Yeah. So, thank you. Order! Order! Are there any more questions? The jury will retire to consider its verdict. Has the jury agreed? We have, Your Worship. And how do you find the prisoner, Charles Darnay? We find the prisoner not guilty. Mr. Darnay, may we congratulate you, sir? Oh, thank you, Doctor. I'm happy our testimony did you no harm. Thank you, Miss Lucy. I'm sure it did nothing but good. It was Mr. Carton who really won your case. Mr. Carton. Uh, Mr. Carton, sir. Uh, did someone call me? May I thank you, sir, for saving my life? Oh, just a part of my business. Uh, Mr. Carton, this is Dr. Manette. Mr. Lucy Manette. No, Mr. Carton. We thought you were splendid, Mr. Carton. Huh. Mere professional claptrap. <laughs> May I ask, sir, how did you happen to notice the resemblance between you and me? Well, it's very simple. I looked at you and admired your bearing and your character. You see, I have nothing but admiration for myself. <laughs> well, uh, 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 Lucy, my dear, uh, we must go. Goodbye, Mr. Darnay. Will you call at our house soon? Well, thank you, Miss Lucy. And Mr. Carton? Aye. Oh, thank you. Good day, then. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, doctor. Uh, Mr. Carton, would you care to dine with me? You feel you must repay me? Hmm? Oh, I could never repay you for my life, sir. No, don't you be too certain. Well, a bottle of wine or two, perhaps. My fees are very low. Another glass, Mr. Darnay. Uh, thank you, I've had enough. Well, Mr. Darnley, how does it feel to be alive again instead of hanging by your neck? <laughs> well, I'm a little confused regarding time and place, but it's good to feel at home in the world again. Yes, must be an immense satisfaction. Uh, as for me, the world has very little to offer except wine like this. So, you and I are not very much alike in that particular, are we? Hmm? Oh, you speak very faintly, Mr. Darnay. I didn't speak at all, sir. <laughs> Come, Mr. Darnay. Why don't you call a help? Give us a toast. What toast, sir? Why, it's on the tip of your tongue, man. I swear it's there. It's been there all evening. Out with it. Very well, then. To Miss Lucy Manette. Miss Manette. There's a fair young lady to hand into a coach in the dark. Hey, Mr. Donnie? There's a fair young lady to be pitied by and wept for by. How does it feel? Is it worth being tried for one's life to be the object of such sympathy and compassion? I don't take your meaning, sir. <laughs> Mr. Donnie, let me ask you a question. Do you think I particularly like you? You've acted as if you do, but I don't think you do. I don't think I do either. But nevertheless, I I hope there's nothing in that dislike to prevent my calling for the reckoning and parting without your blood. Oh, oh nothing at all. No. Did you you call the, the whole reckoning? If I may, sir. Well, in that case, waiter, innkeeper, more wine. Yes, sir. Good night, Mr. Carr. Uh, good night. Uh, one, one last word, Mr. Zane. You think I'm drunk. I think you've been drinking, Mr. Carr. You know I've been drinking. Since I must say so, I know it. You shall likewise know why. 
I care for no man on earth. And no man on earth cares for me. Much to be regretted. You might have used your talents better. Uh, maybe so, Mr. Downey, maybe not. Good night, sir. Good night. And don't let your sober face elate you. For you never know what it may come to. <laughs> Innkeeper, more wine. Coming, sir. Well, Carton, has Mr. Downey shown you what you have fallen away from? What you might have been? Change places with him. And what you have been looked at by those blue eyes as he was. Huh? Ah, come on, hurry down in plain words, you hate the fellow. Sidney Carton knew it was too late to change his way of life, but he took to brushing his shabby coat and combing his untidy hair. And there were times even when he remembered that a gentleman doesn't drink himself nightly into a stupor. On Sunday afternoons, he would appear in Miss Manette's garden, sitting quietly, speaking but seldom, for Charles Downey was there too. One evening, just at dusk, an approaching storm sent them indoors. Listen, it's coming soon, Mr. Downey. It comes slowly but surely. Isn't it impressive? Sometimes when I've sat here of an evening like this, listening to the thunder in the distance, I've had such a strange fancy. I've imagined that the thunderclaps were echoes. Echoes of all the footsteps that will one day enter our lives. Well, if that is so, there's a great crowd coming into our lives. So I take them into mine gladly. Oh, it was my foolish fancy, Mr. Carton. Ah, there's a great crowd bearing down upon us now. Thousands upon thousands. Here they come. Ah. Yes, I'm curious. Oh, you make my fancy seem too real, Mr. Carson. There was a great crowd coming into their lives. The numberless, overpowering crowd which one day would decide the fate of these three. At first, it was but a whisper in the city of Paris. A whisper that was to grow with the years into a crashing roar of hatred. Slowly but surely, as the storm came, the crowd was coming too. Up from the cellars of Paris, up from the bare fields of a starving peasantry, the crowd was coming, chanting its hate, screaming for blood. The people of France, in all their might, rising in revolution. bring you Act Two of A Tale of Two Cities. The little seamstress, condemned to die with him within the hour, listens quietly, her eyes fixed on his face. As time went on, Sidney Carton appeared less and less in the Manette home. More and more was he the slave of the low companions and low habits that he scorned but yielded to. And he knew that Lucy loved Charles Downey. It was an evening in April, almost ten years ago, that Charles Downey spoke to Lucy's father. I've only hinted at marriage to Lucy, sir. I, I didn't want to speak until... Well, there are certain things about myself that you should know. Yes? Dr. Manette, my name is not Downey. I chose that name when I first left France and my heritage. Heritage? I'm of noble birth, sir, but I do not boast of it. Through generations, my family gained its wealth at the expense of the poor. When my uncle died, I was the sole remaining heir. I returned to France to sign away my title to the estate. Why do you tell me this? Because, sir, uh, I know what you have suffered at the hands of the French aristocracy. Your uncle's name? And yours? What? What was it? saint Evremont. <gasps> the Marquis saint Evremont. He was... A doctor. You're ill, sir. No. Charles, Lucy is not to know what you've just told me. Not now, do you mean? Not now or ever. She's not to know. Your word. 
Very well, Doctor. You have my word. Now, go, Peter. Go. Santa Vermont. Santa Vermont. Manette. Open the door, Dr. Manette. I found the key in the storeroom. Give it to me, will you? And take Miss Lucy downstairs. Yes, sir. Come, my dear. Come, my lady bird. Dr. Manette. Dr. Manette, what are you, what are you doing? Do you hear me, doctor? What work is this you're doing? A lady's shoe. A young lady is walking shoe. It should be finished. Let me be. Sydney, is he all right? Yes, he's all right. Dr. Jennison is with him. You've been very kind to stay so long. I tried to reach Charles, but he wasn't at home. I was so worried. There's nothing to worry about now. A few days and he'll be well again. What could have caused it? After all these years, to go back to that? What happened to How him? How can we know? A shock, perhaps. Some sudden jolt of memory. A man's mind can play queer tricks. Miss Lucy, I've brought you a cup of chocolate. Thank you, Miss Cross. And the doctor says everything will be all right. You're not to worry. Thank you. Well, I... Sidney, you're not leaving. Oh, it's growing late. <laughs> no, not for me, of course, but I doubt if you see the dawn very often. I don't, but I can welcome it today. A few hours ago, everything was so black and fearsome. And now, all my troubles are past. All my hopes reborn. It's always that way, isn't it? There are some hopes a man may have which remain in the shadows forever. Do you have such hopes, Sidney? No. Oh, no, I, I'm I'm like one who died young. Sidney, you have come off into the house in the past few months, and yet we know very little about you, except that you're our friend. Is there nothing I can do to help, Sidney? I could never hope to repay what you've already done. May I tell you something? Will you hear me without shrinking from me? What is it? You have been the last dream of my soul. Seeing you here in your home has, has stirred old shadows that I thought had died out of me. I've heard whispers from old voices impelling me upward that I thought were silent forever. I've had unformed ideas of, of striving afresh, fighting out the abandoned fight. But a dream. All a dream, but I wish you to know that you inspired it. Sidney, will nothing of it remain? Perhaps. The dream might linger on after the dreamer awakes. But will you will you hold me in your mind as sincere in this one thing? I would embrace any sacrifice for you or for those dear to you. Think now and then that there's a man who, who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you. The poor fool, Cotton, <laughs> drunk this time with self pity. From that day on, he was seen rarely in the Manette home. He was there when Lucy and Danny were married, and again some years later when their child was born, a girl. But his visits were short, and he would slip away at the first opportunity. In France, during these years, the echoing footsteps of the crowd have been growing louder. Grim patriots who would bathe the soil of France in the blood of the hated nobility. And then the storm broke in all its fury. In July 1789, 
They swarmed from the rat holes of Paris to cover the country with a blanket of red. An army of vengeance bent upon destruction and death. Come only when every noble head has rolled from every noble shoulder. And in this meeting, I have inscribed their names. The names of those who have starved us, killed us. And for every six, another head shall roll. For every six, we shall be avenged. <laughs> for Mr. Sidney Carr. The inn is not open. There's no inn in London open at this time of night. I want to see Mr. Sidney Carr. Let me in. Now, where is he? He's in there. within the hour. For Paris? There is some business there that I must attend to at once. Paris? Oh, 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 oh. very warm this time of the year. Hmm. If I were your lawyer, I should advise against the journey. How much do you know of me? This is excellent wine, Mr. Darnay. French wine. From the cellars of the aristocrats who fled the country. There will be few of these bottles left now. It's being poured into the streets. Along with the blood of the nobles who once drank it. <laughs> hmm. Must you go to Paris, Mr. Darnay? I see there is little I have to explain to you. But I received a letter this morning from a man who was once my servant. They have threatened to send him to the guillotine. Unless he can explain why he's in possession of certain property. That's why I must go to save his life. Ah, what of your own life? Oh, I'll be in no danger. I've renounced my inheritance. It's easily proved. Well, why do you come to me? Well, there's no one else I can turn to. I don't know how long I shall be gone. I should like to feel that there is someone here in London who is watching over my family. Why? Oh, you trust me? You watch over your child, your wife. Yes. I know that you love her. When did you say you must leave? Tonight, now. Uh, hmm. Well, there's no fear about your family. They'll be safe. Thank you, Carl. Good night. Good night. That's the... Mr. Carlton, more wine, sir? Uh, no. No, no, take it away. <laughs> Coach, where are you going, citizen? I'm going to Paris. Let me see your papers. If you will hurry, please, citizen. I must be in Paris within the hour. What is your name, citizen? Charles Darnay. Darnay, also known as Evremont. Why? Yes, but you are consigned, Evremont, to the prison of La Force. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return with Act Three of A Tale of Two Cities, starring Ronald Coleman and Heather Angel. How would you like to improve your position in your unit? Or perhaps you'd like a change in classification? Well, a step in the right direction would be a course with the United States Armed Forces Institute. Yes, a course with USAFI is an indication of your desire to improve yourself. In the past 20 years, USAFI has proved conclusively that men who use their off-duty time constructively are more proficient in their military duties. See your education officer about a USAFI course. 
And now, Mr. Keeley returns to the microphone. You're invited to join us after the final curtain for a brief chat with tonight's star. Here's Act Three of A Tale of Two Cities, starring Ronald Coleman as Sidney Carton and Heather Angel as Lucy Manette. <laughs> The sun rises slowly over the roofs of Paris, and the long shadow of the guillotine falls against the walls of Lafort's prison. In the cell of the condemned, Sidney Carton speaks in a hushed voice. His story, meant only for the years of the little scene. They brought Charles Darnay here, to Lafort's prison, to be held in secret. But somehow the news filtered back to England, and soon his wife and child were in Paris with Dr. Manetta and Mr. Lorry. Mr. Lorry? Yes, they're old friends. For months they waited for some word from Darnay and his cell, but no word came. And every day through the streets, the tumbrils passed, filled with condemned, on their last journey to the guillotine. Father, father, did you see Charles? Did you see him? No. They wouldn't take me to his cell, but I have news. Yes. Charles is summoned tomorrow for trial. Tomorrow? Oh, Father. I think it'll go well, my child. They're going to allow me to testify for him. You? They'll brand you as a traitor. They'll kill you, Father. Oh, my child, I bear a charmed life in this city. I've been a prisoner in the Bastille. you know to understand that you endorsed the accused, the prisoner, Charles Evermont? That is so. He is of noble blood. He is a traitor. He is no traitor. I will swear to it. Dr. Manette, we know your life. The cause you fought for. You are one of us. Yes, and as one of you I speak. The accused Charles Evermont was my first friend when I was released from the Bastille. The accused Charles Evermont is my daughter's husband. In all these years, he has had no part in the tyranny against which we fought. He's renounced his share of the estate and returned it to the people. Charles Edremond is no enemy of the revolution. I give you my word, he is innocent. Free the prisoner! The doctor of Beauvais says he is innocent! Free him! Yes. Is the jury ready to declare itself? We are. How say you then? Let the prisoner be free! Yes. I say the prisoner shall stand accused. By whom, citizeness? By three voices. By my husband, Ernest Dog. By myself. And the third? By the doctor of Bombay, Dr. Alexander Manette. Oh, I protest. I, I protest. Kill me, citizeness. Kill me, all you. Dr. Manette, you have said Charles Everyman was your first friend. I was your first friend. It was to my wine shop you were brought, where you made shoes under my care. You knew yourself then only as a number. One hundred and five North Tower. The cell in which we have been confined. Is that not true? If you say it is, I must believe it. I can't remember. But I remembered. And I resolved one day to examine that cell. And on the day the Bastille fell, I went to one hundred and five North Tower. Hear me, citizens! In that cell hidden in the stonework of the wall, I found a paper. A paper written by Dr. Manette in the year 1767, before the dark and loneliness had driven him mad. It is that paper I hold in my hand now. It describes in the doctor's words how he was called one night to attend a peasant girl, dying in a miserable bed of rags. A girl and her unborn child. In the stable... Her brother, with a wound in his chest, was to breathe his last before the morning. And why? Because those two creatures had protested against the noble family who held them in bondage. Had protested against the murder of the girl's father and her husband. Killed by those same noble hands. The doctor buried the girl and her brother the following day. But he had seen too much. And heard too much from the lips of that dying girl. That night, the doctor was thrown into the Bastille. 
the noble family had silenced him forever. And the name of that family, the name of those murderers, St. Everyman! Yes, St. Everyman! And now, hear this! Listen to the words of Dr. Alexander Manette himself. The words he wrote. I, Alexander Manette, prisoner of the Bastille, having thus set forth the causes for my imprisonment, to denounce the Marquis St. Everyman and his descendants against the time when these crimes shall be answered for. I denounce them to heaven and earth! Oh. 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 You ask me to stop! Listen to me! I have long had the crimes of the Everyman family knitted in my registers. At my husband, is that so? It is so. On the great day when the Bastille fell, I dropped this paper home and we read it together. My husband and I asked him, is that so? It is so. Then I told him I had a secret to communicate to him. I struck this bosom with these two hands as I strike it now and I said, Defarge, I was brought up among the fishermen of the seashore. And that peasant family so injured by the every month is my family. That sister of a mortally wounded boy was my sister. That husband was my sister's husband. That unborn child was their child. That brother was my brother. Those dead are my dead. And that summons to answer those things is sent to me. Ask him, is that so? It is so. Then tell when the fire to stop. But don't tell me. the prison of La Force to await death by the guillotine. That was the sentence passed by the tribunal. That same night, a coach left Calais for Paris, carrying but one passenger, slouched low in the seat, his shabby greatcoat pulled high about his neck. Reaching Paris, he haunted the inns and taverns, wandered like a lonely ghost through the city and at last made his way to the lodging house where Lucy waited news from La Porte. Sidney. Sidney Carton. Oh, you must forgive my coming at this hour. I didn't wish to be seen. I knew you'd come. I've been waiting. Sidney, they're going to take Charles. They're going to kill him. How long has he? Until the morning. Yeah. And they won't let me see him. I can't be near him these last hours. Remember what you said long ago? The dark hours before the dawn. There will be no dawn tomorrow. It will be dark now. Always. Oh, Lucy. If there was some way I could comfort you, you, you must hope. What hope is there? What comfort? My husband is going to die. Oh, Lucy. <gasps> oh, Sidney, forgive me. You were right. I have no strength to offer you. You came to us tonight. I shall never forget that. I tell you it is useless to speak to Dr. Manette. He is in no condition to see you now. Uh, Mr. Lowry, if you'll forgive me. There is nothing you can do here, Mr. Carton. Nothing. Mr. Lowry... You're a man of business, aren't you? I am. Well, I'm here on business. Really, sir? Oh, I know your opinion of me, Mr. Lorry, but a drinking man may learn things around the town. If he can listen at the same time. I have learned that Dr. Manette is in great danger. He and Lucy must leave Paris tonight. Leave Paris? And they must take the child with them. But, but why? The revenge of Madame Defarge does not stop with Charles. The accusations against the Marquis Saint Evremond and all his race. Lucy, her child. Now, may I see Dr. Manette? It would do no good, sir. He has gone back to his work. His work? He would not know what you are saying, Mr. Cotton. Mr. Lorry, you. You have a pass that will let you through to Calais. Will it serve for Dr. Manette and Lucy? Yes, for as many as are with me. Then you will use it tonight. You will arrange for a coach. 
to meet you all here at midnight. The coach will take you to the side gate of La Force Prison. Do you understand? The prison? Yes. There you will be joined by another person who will make the trip with you to England. But you must not stop to ask questions. You will proceed at once to the gates of Paris and on to Calais as fast as the coach can take you. But this, this other person, who will it be? Who? Uh, Mr. Sidney Carter. I don't understand. Oh, I may be in poor condition for travel. <laughs> I, you, I usually am at that hour. But as soon as I am in the coach, drive on. But you, at the gate of La Force, will you be within the prison tonight? Yes. Yes, I'm going to see Charles. A certain Mr. Barthard, English spy, is a turnkey in the prison. He'll open the doors for me. Oh, I, I don't understand all this, sir, but you give me hope. And you will save them all, Mr. Lorry. <laughs> Not only I, sir. I shall have a young and ardent man at my side. Yes, with the help of heaven, you shall. Tell me, Mr. Lorry, yours is a long life to look back on? I mean, my 78 years, sir. You've been useful all your life. Trusted, respected. There are many in this world who'd miss you. A solitary old bachelor? No, there's nobody to weep for me. Wouldn't she weep for you, Lucy? Yes, thank God. I, I didn't quite mean what I said. It is a thing to thank God for, isn't it? Surely, surely. Mr. Larry, if you had to say with truth tonight, I have gained the love of no human creature. I have done nothing good nor serviceable to be remembered by. Your 78 years would be... Seventy-eight heavy curses, would they not? I think they would be. But you are not old, Carson. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm not old. <laughs> but the road I took was never the way to A. <laughs> well, good night, Mr. Larry. I said, yes. How long before Johnny is taken from his cell and put with the others? I can't tell that. That's only an hour now. I'll leave us alone, but stay within call. You'll keep your promise. I told you I could get you in and out again. Up here, both to try to leave. I know, I know. Open the door. Who's there? Have you come for... Cotton, you! Of all the people on earth, I'm the least expected, is that it? Why are you here? I came to see you. You shouldn't have taken the risk. It can serve no purpose. It can serve one. I bring you a message from Lucy. A message? A request, rather. That you do exactly as I say and ask no questions. Now take off your coat. Take off my... Yes, take it off and change it for mine, quickly. Are you mad? Well, do as I say. It's her wish. Now, put on my coat. And, and your hair. Rumple it. So, that, that's it as mine is. Cotton, there's no escaping from this place. You'll only die with me. Oh, have I mentioned escape? Now, do as I say. Now, here, take my cravat. And, and give me your... Oh, Cotton, I warn you. Be quiet. Be quiet. Look. Put a pen and ink on that table. Is your hand steady enough to write? Was when you came in. Ah, uh, steady it then, and write what I dictate. Quickly. To whom do I address it? Oh, to no one. Write. If you remember... The words that passed between us long ago. You will understand when you see this. Has it written that? I don't. What vapor is that? Vapor? Yes. A strange odor. Something crossed me. Oh, I'm not conscious of it. I take up the pen and finish. I told you once that there was nothing that I would not do. Nothing that I would not. Well, what is it? There is something. That odor. Oh, you mean this on my handkerchief? Yes, it's so. Breathe deeply. Oh, breathe. No, no, no. Yes, yeah. breathe. Breathe. Yes. Yeah. You, down there. Back at are you finished? Are you ready to... That's it. What's the matter with him? Nothing. He's unconscious. Carry him out to the gate. But you... You changed the Listen. Listen to me. Listen. Sidney Carton fainted from the shock of parting with an old friend. Now, if you'll find a coach at the side gate, put him into it. 
tell them to drive as fast as they can to Cali. No, no, wait. Wait, I'll finish this note. If you remember the words that passed between us, you will understand. I told you once there was nothing I would not do to keep a life you love beside you. God bless you. falls on the roaring crowds of Paris and the chosen destiny of Sidney Carton, and rises again on our two stars of the evening, Ronald Coleman and Herbert Angel, who brought to life so vividly a truly great play. Well, Bill, you not only gave me one of my favorite actresses as leading lady, but I'd like also to say thank you to Janet Scott for a wonderful Madame Defarge, and thanks, too, to a magnificent supporting cast. One of the biggest casts you ever had on, isn't it, Mr. Keeley? One of the biggest and best, but no more than the play deserves. Good night. Good night. Good night. Charles Dickens would be proud of both of you. <laughs> this is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood.